Okay, so now time comes to start the seminar. Uh, good afternoon or uh, good evening for most of you, and uh, some of you may good morning. But uh, yeah, we are very happy to start today's uh, seminar, yeah. our first JSC Concrete Committee webinar, uh, Frontiers of Concrete Technologies. So. Uh, this is a uh, event organized by JSC, Japan Society of Civil Engineers. And then title of today's seminar is Use of FRP Composite for Sustainable Concrete Structures. We invite the famous two professors from China today. So before starting that, so since this is a first seminar, please let me introduce the organizer, JSC. So, okay. I'm Nagai uh, from the University of Tokyo. I will moderate today's uh, uh, event and seminars. I'm very happy to be host to you for today's event. And then the, we are the member of the JSC, Japan Society of Civil Engineers. So, okay. So the JSC has long histories. It launched in 1914, and we have over 100 years histories and then current or member over uh, 38,000 that covers all the field in civil engineers, not only structural engineers, but that uh, coastal engineers, uh, transportation management and so on. Then that uh, we have long histories and have so many members in Japan and also that uh, overseas as well. Then that I hope you know about JSC more and if you have time, please visit our homepage, JSC homepage, and also Facebook as well. Then we distribute the newsletter monthly. Every month we have. Then the, we have the International Activity Centers, IAC. Actually, the, today is, I invited our researcher, Professor Weda. He was the chairman of the uh, IAC for long years. The, in JSC, uh, there are many, uh, several uh, research committees. One of them is a concrete committee. Then today's event is organized by the concrete committee of JSCE. Then we are doing many research work and then one of the main uh, task of this concrete committee is to publish the design code, JSC standard specification for concrete structures. And some of them are uh, translate it in English. Then once you find the website, yeah, you can download it freely. It's a free publication. If you are interested in, please join our website as well to download the design code. Also, we issue the newsletters every three or four times and distribute our latest activities. Then the, uh, you can get our uh, activities. Then furthermore, we are doing the international seminar almost every year. So for example, uh, in Indonesia or Thailand or Mongolia, Mongol and so on. So mainly in Asian countries, but sometimes in European countries. So yeah, we are trying to distribute our activities more and also try to transfer our knowledge and technologies to overseas countries from Japan. But uh, as you know, that due to that uh, situation of COVID-19, it's quite difficult to have a uh, in-person seminars now. So therefore, yeah, today's seminar, we launched it newly. That is a, a frontiers of concrete technology where we wanna share and discuss the latest technology. Yeah, basically it's uh, research oriented things we want to share among you, then that, yeah, we believe that this is sometimes would be better than the seminar at site because you can join anywhere from all over the world. And then today is the first seminar. We are going to hold that seminar maybe three or four times a year. The next seminar will be announced at the end of today's seminar. It will be in August next month. But anyway, today is the first one. 
Then as a first lecture, we are very happy to invite two distinguished professors from China, but uh, they are strongly related to Japan. So the title is Use of FRP Composites for Sustainable Concrete Structures. Then one of the, the first invited res researcher is Professor Weda uh, from the uh, Shenzhen University, China, and also, yeah, he's Japanese. And then uh, one more uh, researcher is Professor Zhang Dai from the Hong Kong uh, Polytechnic University, China. And he has a strong relationship with Japan. He got a PhD uh, from the from Japanese University, Hokkaido University, under the supervision by Professor Weda. And then the, uh, today's event, the moderator is me, Kohei Nagai, the University of Tokyo. And before starting that uh, presentation by the invited researchers, please let me introduce the brief schedule today. And now we are here introduction of the seminar. After that, yeah, we request, we ask Professor Weda to give a presentation on this uh, topic for about 30 minutes. After that, a uh, short Q&A if necessary, but it depends on the time. But after that, yeah, we have a, a next presentation from Professor Dai. Then after the short Q&A, we're gonna have some uh, discussion time. So because not only just introducing the latest activities, but uh, yeah, mainly I will ask about the background or history of this research field and also the future direction of that. Then lastly, we will announce the next seminars. So uh, since that, yeah, even now over hundred participants, yeah, you join. So, so it's quite difficult to receive all the questions from you directly. So therefore, if you have any question or comments, yeah, please fill in the Q&A box. You can find that. Then uh, I'm not so sure whether we can answer during this event, but at least yeah, we will transfer all the Q&A and uh, question and the comments to the uh, Professor Weda and the Professor Tai. Then we can, uh, you, you can get the reply later. And also, the, uh, after the event, if you registered in advance, then we have your email address so that we request you to answer to the follow-up questionnaire. So then in that uh, questionnaire, you can also fill in the question to the seminars. And also, so if you cannot connect to the Zoom address well, uh, you can also uh, access this event from the YouTube. Uh, even now, already the live streaming is started. So if you have some problem, please join from the YouTube site. Okay, so yeah, my uh, opening introduction is finished. Then let me move on to the uh, first presentation from the Professor Weda. So to, to start that, let me introduce him to you. But uh, as you can see, once we start to introduce about Professor Weda, it takes a long time. So I'm so sorry that I will just pick up the important points only. But anyway, yeah, now Professor Weda is a distinguished professor at Shenzhen University, China, and the Professor Emeritus of Hokkaido University, Japan. And his research interests uh, in numerical analysis of concrete and hybrid structures, prediction of life cycle of con structures, upgrading of structures, seismic design and structural design methodology. And he is, current, he is currently a fellow and technical council members of International Federation for Structure Concrete, FYB, and a fellow and advisory committee chair of International Institute of FRP in uh, construction, IIFC, and the past president of Asian Concrete Federation, ACF, and the past chairman of ISOTC SC7, maintenance and repair of concrete structures. And then he is going to be a chairman of the uh, ISOTC 71. Already become or uh, soon? I'm not so sure, but anyway, he will lead this field as a leader of the world. And then past president of JSC. So yeah, uh, 
we are sure that that uh, he's the well, one of the most famous professor in this field, and we are very happy to have a, a presentation from him today. So, okay, Professor Weda, if you are ready, can you start your presentation? It is about 30 minutes, please. Right. Thank you for your introduction. Can you, can I, sh I mean, I'm sharing my slides. Yes, I can see your slide. Okay. All right, and uh, your screen is on the right screen? Yes, or? it's okay. okay. Yeah, Good. presentation screens. Okay, thank you very much for your kind and very long introduction. And uh, yeah, today's topic is somehow reflecting one of the, my main research topic of the FRP composite. And uh, of course, another lecturer today, Dr. Dai, he is also, I think, more active in FRP composite nowadays. So I'm not sure what he's talking about. So uh, I try to uh, pick up some topic which he may not uh, pick up. Then Dr. Dai Kandri sent me uh, his presentation slides beforehand. Fortunately, we don't have much overlap. So the... Uh, Oops, it takes some time. Oops, this one. It doesn't go further. Oh yes, finally. Okay, uh, this is my today's talk. Uh, I start with some general aspect, which may be uh, too basic thing to the most of the audience, but uh, I recently corrected such information by myself. And those information quite interesting to me. And I often use this information to the, my lecture to the student. So I hope that uh, it would be also useful to the most of the audience today. Then after that, I try to say briefly how FRP composite can contribute to the uh, sustainability or sustainable development goals. Then I talk about uh, some specific uh, technical aspects. Today, I try to give you the four points for uh, research topics, which I have been involved. And uh, some of them is an uh, ongoing project uh, in China, and also my collaboration in, with the Japanese companies. Okay, let me start with the, uh, something about the sustainability of structures. I think uh, in last one decade was maybe some of the earlier discussion may start uh, two decades ago. We try to talk about uh, our structures, how we, our structure or infrastructure to make contribution to the sustainable, sustainable development, or uh, what, what is a sustainable structure itself. Then as you, might have known already, uh, sustainability, we have the three pillars, social sustainability, environmental sustainability, and economic sustainability. Uh, social sustainability is for our structure engineers, uh, fundamental aspects like uh, how to keep safety or serviceability or durability or so on to have the long uh, life of the structures. The environmental sustainability is to, we have to consider uh, impact to the environment. It can be positive or it can be negative. So we have to consider uh, the integral with integrated, integrated approach to minimize uh, negative impact or maximize uh, positive impact through the infrastructure. Of course, any human activity related to economic sustainability. Without economic sustainability, we cannot uh, continue our activities. Uh, everyone knows this. Then uh, recently, I found uh, one interesting article 
I believe this is written authored by the non-engineer, non-civil engineers. The title of the article is a critical role of infrastructure for sustainable development goals, uh, which you can find economist. Then particular sentence in this article say, infrastructure uh, play a key role in all three dimensions of sustainable development namely the economy, environment, and society. One of the infrastructure's most important roles, increasing resilience, runs across all the three of the, the, uh, these pillars, meaning uh, providing good infrastructures. All the three pillars can be firmly integrated so that we can achieve sustainable development goal. And as you know, uh, this is the, uh, yeah, this is the yeah, UN Sustainable Development Goals. I suppose everyone at least uh, seeing, you have seen this uh, pictures. And uh, we have 17 goals and in total 164 targets. And as you can see here, some of the goals uh, directly related to our civil engineering or infrastructures, such as the uh, uh, number nine. Number nine, I don't know. Sorry. Uh, number nine, industry innovation and infrastructure. And uh, number 11, sustainable cities and uh, communities. So you can see our infrastructure directly related to those uh, goals. Then I found another interesting article in the Nature Sustainability. The title is Infrastructure for Sustainable Development. Uh, this article uh, very precisely examine how infrastructure affects directly or indirectly each targets among the, all the 17 goals. And this diagram shows the, some of the examples, uh, picking up the uh, six goals. And uh, a gray shaded area is the targets which are affected indirectly by infrastructures. And the darker shade is the targets which are affected directly by infrastructures. So you can see many targets are related to the infrastructure. So in total, 72% of the targets are somehow affected by infrastructures. Uh, it is more direct investigation for civil engineering or infrastructure itself. Uh, this article is taken from the uh, FIB symposium 2020 which was held online by, organized by Tonji University last year. Then the title of the article is the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and the Concrete. So how concrete or concrete structures influence those targets? And uh, again, the author made a very precise examination. And as a result of the examination, also concluded that uh, 48% of the total targets influenced by concrete or concrete structures. And uh, even you may imagine that uh, quality education or gender equality is affected by infrastructure or concrete structures. And the uh, bottom photo, I found uh, this photo from the website. This is a one small project to construct a toilet in the uh, school in the rural area of the Cambodia. They don't have enough toilet. Of course, the school boys, they may not uh, care about the toilets, but the girls, uh, if they don't have the proper toilet, they are reluctant to go to school. So it's a kind of the negative impact to the uh, quality education or gender equality. So through constructing the toilet, I mean concrete uh, structure toilet, we 
affect, influence those goals. Okay, I'm talking about something about the positive effect of the infrastructure or concrete structures. But at the same time, we have to pay more attention for negative effect. Then probably all of the participants today know this fact. Concrete is our human-made uh, product with a very huge amount, probably largest amount, followed by the water. Uh, annually, 29 billion tons or 12 billion cubic meter of concrete are estimated to be uh, produced. Uh, this volume is equivalent to 3,000 Giza pyramids. So every year we produce concrete this much of the volume, 3,000 big pyramids, or 430 three gorge dams. I just visited the three gorge dam two weeks, 10 days ago. Yeah, it was huge concrete structure. Then to produce such amount of the concrete, what is necessary? I mean, natural resources. We need a cement production of 4 billion tons. To have 4 billion tons of cement, you need a lime, clay, slag, silica, gypsum, 4.2, 0 0.88, 0 0.11, 0 0.26, 0 0.14 billion tons expect, uh, respectively. And also we need uh, 2.3 billion tons of water and uh, 10 billion tons of fine aggregate and 12.5 billion of coarse aggregate, which means we use a lot of natural resources. Not only consumption of the natural resources, through the concrete production or construction of concrete structures, which is a cause of the CO2 emission. And I took those figures from the lecture uh, by Dr. Kasuga, who is current FID president. Uh, through cement production, annual cement production, 3 billion tons of the CO2 emission. And uh, to have such much concrete, const uh, structures, including all the logistics and all the construction activities, it produced another 7 billion tons of CO2. And those values in total more than 10 billion tons of CO2 emission, you can compare with CO2 emission of the, some major countries. China, uh, this moment the largest CO2 emission country, 9.3 billion nearly 10 billion ton, followed by US, <coughs> 4.7 billion ton, and EU, 3.2 billion ton, and Japan, 1.1 billion ton. Which means, <coughs> cement production alone, this is almost same as CO2 emission of four EU. And uh, all the construction activity related concrete structures, is more than CO2 emission from China. So we have to take some actions. Uh, then this is another interesting uh, statistics, CO2 emission from economic, uh, economic activities. I took those values, but uh, I prepared, I made a calculation by myself. Uh, looking at the uh, CO2 emission per economic activities or uh, per every 10,000 US dollars economic activities. Then naturally from the, this figure, you can see CO2 emission is steadily decreasing, which means every country, your country have the economical development, which means also at the same time, technological development, CO2 emission become less per uh, uh, unit uh, economic activities. Then uh, China, I don't know why, but uh, it used to be say 30 years ago, very large CO2 emission. I cannot uh, find a particular reason to explain this one, but uh, at the same time, China is a very excellent country to reduce CO2 emission drastically, as you can see here. But uh, nevertheless, 
uh, less developed country or developing country, their CO2 emission uh, unit economic activity is greater than developed country. So we are expecting uh, in the future, though developed country CO2 emission become steadily uh, decreasing. Then best country so far I found is Switzerland. Switzerland is very small CO2 emission uh, unit economic activities. Uh, then coming back to the cement itself or concrete, cement production, yeah, it's indicating the, our economic activities or infrastructure development. We have very steady increase of the cement production, but the last six years or seven years, fortunately or unfortunately, uh, total <coughs> cement production in the world stop increasing, as you can see here. The reason I believe is simply a cement production, China is stop increasing. Then at the same time, you can see more than 50% of cement production comes from China. Then how technological development help uh, CO2 emission reduction of the, uh, CO, uh, through the uh, cement production? I believe the uh, uh, Japanese technology for cement production is one of the top country, leading each country. Then this is statistics taken from the uh, Cement Association of Japan. And the thermal energy at the top figure and the bottom figure is electrical power energy. <coughs> they are indicating indirectly how much CO2 emission you have. Then those energy consumption is especially thermal energy, we have steady decrease. But seems to be electrical power energy, you don't have much reduction in recent years. Then you can see, um, if you see that this diagram more precisely, in fact, as our cement industry, we are contributing to use waste product, uh, burning those waste, I mean garbage. But uh, this is contributing to the reduction of the waste or garbage, but uh, in terms of thermal energy or CO2 emission, it does not help much. So from those figures, we can say that we cannot expect much further technological development cannot reduce much CO2 emissions through the cement production. So knowing those facts, what we can do as a civil engineers, especially structure engineering point of view, what we can do is extension of service life of structures or recycle and the reuse of concrete or utilization of industrial waste as concrete material. Then extension service life of structures, which is my remaining talk today, uh, make a durable structures or repairing strengthening or intervention structures, a structure with flexible usage. This is something uh, three key direction to have the extension service life of structures. Once you have uh, extended service life, naturally necessary energy or necessary natural resources definitely to, to be reduced. Then how our FRP composite can make a contribution? Of course, uh, FRP reinforcement, uh, primary reason to introduce FRP reinforcement is uh, corrosion resistance. Corrosion is a weak point of the steel reinforcement. Then also uh, strengthening by FRP, yeah, utilizing uh, this corrosion resistance and also lightness. We can have the many technology for repairing uh, strengthening of this uh, by FRP composite. So FRP composite can contribute to the for the extension service rainfall structure. Then from now, I talk about how we promote more uh, usage of the FRP composite in infrastructures. The first 
Our topic is here, as you can see here, strengthening by deformability of material rather than strength. Uh, this is a figure which I often use in my lecture. Uh, this is a stress-strain relationship of the major structure of materials. Then one extreme case is a steel. Yeah, steel is the bottom of those comparison, which indicating very large strain at the end, but the strength is very small. Then on the other hand, carbon at the other end, uh, strain, ultimate strain is very small, only 1.5%, but the uh, ultimate strength is very high. So from this, Somehow, I don't know if this is generally true or not, but most of the material comparison show higher strength and stiffness, smaller fracturing strain, ultimate strain. The, so carbon is the most extreme cases. Then we have somehow between like uh, mostly organic uh, fiber, Polyacetal, so far, what I have found is polyacetal or pen or pet. Their st uh, stiffness and strength is much lower than carbon or aramid, but fracture strength is much bigger. And most at the same time, usually high strength or high stiffness material is more expensive. So steel is least expensive, and the pet polyacetal is also less expensive than carbon. So higher fracturing strain, deformability, we have to look at this nature, especially for steel, why we are using steel. One of the reason is this high fracturing strain so that we can have the very ductile uh, member behavior, which is necessary on the seismic event. Then, <clears throat> Uh, strength and stiffness can be replaced. You can imagine you, with a simple calculation, 2000 megapascal strength with 100 square meter cross section can be replaced by 200 megapascal strength with 1000 uh, square millimeter cross section. But the deformability cannot be replaced by the poor deformable material. That is an issue. Then from the uh, some uh, numerical and experimental investigation for the shear reinforcement, best performance can be found with less uh, greater fracturing strain, such as around 5% or more, and uh, with proper rather good uh, stiffness. So for carbon, very high stiffness, stiffness necessary to, to gain high sh shear strength, but the carbon unfortunately has a low fracturing strain. So you cannot utilize fully shear strength, your shear contribution concrete. And the steel, yeah, it's good in terms of the fracturing strain, but uh, after yielding, uh, stiffness become drastically small, uh, getting uh, become smaller, which means uh, shear strength becomes smaller. Then considering those fact best uh, material is rather elastic nature of the material with moderately high fracturing strain. Then one of the material is pet fiber like this and uh, it can be deformed very largely without fracturing. Then having uh, this uh, material, one company in Japan can develop the uh, interesting uh, jacketing uh, method, uh, duplex jacketing, meaning we use the two types of the uh, material for the uh, hinge zone, we use the uh, pet fiber. Then non-hinge zone, we use the aramid fiber or so on. So that we can assure uh, same seismic performance with less cost. 
Then we have the many uh, practical application all, already in Osaka, Sapporo, even Nagoya. Then coming to the second uh, topic, which is hybrid usage of FRP and steel reinforcement. The, one of the <coughs> obstruction of the FRP application is a cost and also ductility. Like a carbon fiber, which I just showed, uh, very small uh, fracturing strain. But once you use uh, FRP together with steel reinforcement, we may have some optimum or better uh, options. Cost and the ductility can be better than FRP 100% case, or durability it can be better than still 100% case. Then uh, what we can suggest from the experimentation or numerical simulation, <coughs> uh, tension reinforcement, FRP at the most outer layer, which is close to the uh, concrete uh, surface, and the steel at the inner layer. So we don't have to have the 100% uh, FRP reinforcement. The, the inner part whose concrete cover is very large, steel reinforcement can be still used. Or as I said, uh, FRP is a good for the shear reinforcement and also shear reinforcement has a less concrete cover. So FRP to be used as a shear reinforcement and uh, tension reinforcement with the steel. That is also another hybrid. So we don't have much application in this way and uh, we don't have real uh, guideline standards to cover this hybrid usage. But uh, having some in investigation, uh, if we have the proper combination, the, we have quite a ductile manner. The strength is contributed by FRP reinforcement and ductility is contributed by steel, as you can expect. And this is a typical low deformation curve. And also, we can imagine the yeah, distance between uh, steel reinforcement layer and the FRP reinforcement layer would affect a structure performance, ductility. But uh, we conducted those three cases, we don't have much difference in terms of the low deflection curve. And also equally, we have the good, uh, quite a good energy absorption nature. Then uh, this is a simply uh, by numerical simulation, but uh, the, to have uh, one fourth of the elastic modulus, four times of fracture strain compared with GFRP, you can have 80% of absorption energy of equivalent B with steel reinforcement only. So even uh, those energy uh, absorption matter, which is uh, ductility matter, can be solved. Then coming to the third uh, things, multi multifunctional material, which is my ongoing project with us at the Shenzhen University, yeah, usually material is meant for the one particular function for intervention. But in this case, CFRP mesh, oh, sorry, carbon fiber mesh is used for the strengthening at the same time, uh, corrosion, uh, cathodic protection. But we have many issues to cope with, uh, to overcome. Uh, in fact, uh, carbon itself or cementitious material itself can be deteriorated by the uh, induced electrical current. So we need uh, some care for the electrical current control, but at least uh, from our experimental result, we can have 40 years durability, uh, even though there's some reduction of the uh, material property. And also interestingly, uh, chloride ion itself is affecting carbon fiber durability. And in fact, we, once we have the chloride ion in concrete, carbon fiber durability and electrical uh, current, induced current, it can be better. This is interesting as a result. 
But anyway, through the experimentation, uh, this uh, <coughs> ICTPSS is a multifunction carbon fiber mesh. We can have the good cathodic protection. And also certain, yes, we have the good bonding property, even though with some showing some uh, material uh, bond property degradation. Then also finally, I mean, structure performance, it can be uh, assured under the ICCP. Then in the Guangdong province, we already have some practical applications for the concrete structure, I mean, highway concrete structures for this uh, synthesized uh, intervention method. Then even we try to use this method not only existing structures, but also new structures. From the beginning, we can have the better uh, resistance against the chloride ion ingress uh, degradation. Then my last topic is enhancement of the uh, uh, bonding, external bonding, using new idea. <coughs> In fact, this slide show our new concept using a CFRP uh, strand sheet. It's kind of the uh, <clears throat> dry fiber CFRP with, uh, but different from the CFRP plate. Then putting uh, this uh, carbon fiber strand sheet into the uh, uh, group, which is uh, produced for the uh, new surface near surface mounting technology. Then why we do so? <clears throat> By doing so, what we have found is better bonding compared with uh, CFRP rod or CFRP plate, which we usually use for the near surface mounting, mounting the technology. Because uh, FRP strand sheet you have more uh, interferential bond surface, which assure better bond. Uh, because of better bond property, uh, in fact, uh, you can see uh, experimental result. The even pull out bond test, uh, CFRP rupture was observed. And also as the member behavior, you, the member eventually reached the ultimate point with uh, CFRP rupture. So it's quite a good uh, result. And uh, we conduct the two series of the test. <coughs> the second series of test, we have the several the uh, experimental factors, parameters like this arrangement of the group and in comparison with the external bond in the FRP sheet. Then finally, uh, what we observe is either uh, C, uh, strand sheet rupture or concrete cover separation. Yeah, instead of the uh, uh, bond failure at the group, uh, concrete cover separation takes place. So we have to avoid maybe concrete cover separation, but anyway, which shows a much better uh, bonding property. So we are successful to show the, yes, I can show one of the case like this. Yeah, a few seconds, it shows the final. Yeah, this is a case of the uh, rupture. So it's no debonding. Yeah, this is possible with uh, this technology. <clears throat> and also experimental result at the maximum moment region, the uh, final observed strain is almost ultimate strain of the carbon fiber. So at the end, my conclusion, FRP composite provide a good option as a reinforcement for concrete structures. And for certain cases, such as structures under very severe environment, 
FRP reinforcement is a better option. And the partial replacement by FRP reinforcement is also a better option. Through those uh, options, we can promote FRP composite more. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Weda, uh, for your uh, uh, very nice presentation, including the social background that we, especially the younger generation, should face about the uh, sustainability of our work and also includes the latest uh, technology or research topics on FRP. So, yeah, uh, maybe in the panel discussion, we will ask you right again, but uh, may I know about uh, one thing on the cost? Yeah, always when we think about the FRP, the yeah, cost is a become problem and always FRP is more expensive than the uh, conventional reinforced concrete. As a result, you are doing that. For example, the last topic also, maybe you are using as less as possible that FRP, I think. So when, when we think about that yeah, cost, how, how is the current situation or the, the yeah, things to be considered? Can you give some comments on the cost of FRP? Okay, yes. In fact, uh, I have made uh, some research with the uh, company people in Japan. Uh, we have the Industrial Association for the Promotion of FRP Composite, uh, especially the external bond, uh, both uh, FRP Composite. Uh, of course, this is only calculation based. We calculate life cycle cost for the in case of structure under the severe environmental condition, it's a, uh, greatly affected uh, those chloride environment. Then life cycle cost is much less than the case of the steel reinforcement. Mm. I think this is quite true. In fact, actual life cycle cost. Mm. But the only thing is probably we don't have uh, proper standard at this moment, especially for the hybrid usage case, maybe government uh, in Japan are still reluctant to make uh, the application. This is my understanding. Mm. Okay, so that uh, if we can but somehow precisely estimate or calculate the mm. life cycle cost, and also mm. if we can publish some good design guideline, do you believe that uh, yeah, yeah, in many places, FRP can be used? Especially yes. I think, uh, especially like in Japan, coastal area mm. along the Japan seaside, definitely we can make some applications. But I cannot explain why government hasn't yes. made a such attempt yet. Mm, I see. I, I did uh, 10 years ago in Hokkaido, but uh, it was almost successful, but somehow at the final stage, mm. yeah, it was defeated by other options. Mm. But maybe not nowadays, uh, estimation of the future performance mm -hmm. become more precise. Yeah, yes. thanks to the many research is there for that. that may, maybe one of the things we should do is that, yeah, precise prediction or the estimation of the future performance. And then the yes. cost estimation also would be more accurate. Yes. So that, that would be one. So. Yeah. Uh, another short question is about, uh, uh, not the material cost, but the construction cost. So, mm -hmm. that, yeah. that site worker has to treat the FRP material at site. So mm. how is the cost? Is it, uh, is it very difficult and expensive or much cheaper than the conventional, for example, retrofitting method? Well, you are talking about uh, FRP reinforcement, yep. in embedded reinforcement. Embedded reinforcement, almost no different. From ah, okay, no difference, okay. Yes, yeah, still you pay a little more attention to the uh, treatment handling, but uh, repairing method, mm. I don't think we have any special attention necessary in case of FRP compared mm. with even steel reinforcement. Mm. Uh, almost same uh, attention is necessary, care is necessary, I guess. Mm. So Sorry. we don't have any particular uh, disadvantage with FRP composite in case of repairing. But uh, in, yeah, it means that uh, the in practice that yeah, the owner of the infrastructure think about the, just the material cost mm. mainly. 
Yes, initial cost. Yeah, initial. Uh, initial, yes, initial material cost. And material also, material. we don't have real application much, especially embedded cipher field reinforcement. Ah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, the, it makes them reluctant to have the real fast application. Mm -hmm. uh, I see. But uh, for example, your presentation includes the case where that only the near the surface you use the FRP. Yes, that, yes. That's a really nice idea. We don't need to yes. care about the durability problem. That's right. And then okay. inside we use steel. Yes. So they are having enough cover depth and also still have a really good deformability. So yes. The structural safety can be uh, assured by the yes. steel. Yes, so, yes. Mm, but still, yeah, our idea is really excellent, but that in reality, not yet. Used. Yes, probably, yeah, they don't believe me. <laughs> 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 okay. Yeah. Uh, okay, yeah, once we talk, yeah, we can stop that. So that, uh, okay, yeah, let, let us finish that uh, presentation from Professor Weda. Thank you very much, Professor Weda. And then- uh, yeah, Thank you yeah. for good questions. Yeah, let us have a uh, further discussion later. Okay, so let me move on to the next presentation from Professor Ajango Dai. So yes, again, uh, let me introduce him. So I'm glad to welcome Professor uh, oh, oh, thanks. Okay, yeah, he, he changed us, right? But uh, let me introduce him, yeah. Uh, he's a, a pro professor at the Hong Kong Polytech University, and he he graduated with uh, uh, from the Hokkaido University and worked as a research scientist at the Port and uh, uh, Airport Research Institute Japan before joining the current uh, PolyU. So his research theme is emerging materials and structural system for sustainable concrete infrastructures. And the Professor Dai is a vice president of International Institute of FRP for Construction and Technical Board Chair of the Asian Concrete Federation. Then he is a fellow of IIFC and HKIE and the Hong Kong Concrete Institute and so on. And then, the, yeah, please check his publications. Then you will be really surprised <laughs> how many <laughs> papers he's publishing. Unbelievable, many researches uh, he achieved and then many of them on the FRP so that uh, and we can get the latest research achievement from him today. So yeah, let's welcome Prof uh, Professor Dai. Okay, please start your presentation if you're ready. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Nagai, for your very kind introduction. Uh, in fact, I stay with uh, uh, Professor Nagai in the same group at Hokkaido University. Uh, Nagai, at that moment, was always our model, especially <laughs> he made a very excellent you know, presentation. Also, no, no. I learned a lot from his <laughs> research work. Okay. So first of all, of, of course, I would like to acknowledge you know, GSC for giving me uh, this opportunity uh, to share with all of you uh, about my view on FRP composite technology for construction, and, and also uh, share with you uh, some recent activity. Uh, being carried uh, in my research group. So, so I will continue talking. I especially, I'm very happy to see you know, many familiar names in the participant list, okay? So I will continue my talk on uh, use of uh, FRP composite for sustainable concrete infrastructure. In fact, this is a very uh, big topic, okay? So uh, it's quite challenging to talk about this within 30 minutes. So my talk is relevant to a, re a relatively technical, okay? So as Dr. Nagai introduced, I have very strong connection with Japan. And in fact, I'm very honored to talk together with Professor Weda today. Uh, Professor Weda was my PhD supervisor. So you can see this is in fact a photo uh, we taken uh, in 2005 at, at my, you know, at the university I graduated from, Dailin University of Technology, you know, see middle is Professor Weda and uh, uh, right, you know, second one from right is, is myself. So this is uh, another picture taken in 2009. So if you look at my current face, you feel, you know, really aging is a big challenge for our society. You can see very significant aging uh, of myself. 
Of course, we doesn't say he did the much better maintenance than me. So today my talk, in fact, the first is relevant to maintenance strategy for uh, concrete infrastructure. Of course, I will try focus on uh, use of FRP composite. Of course, we have many other methodologies as well. And uh, then uh, after I talk this, you know, different maintenance strategy, I will give two example, okay, on how to use FRP in existing structures and also for new constructions. Uh, how to, what kind of problem uh, we are going to solve and uh, what are the key issues uh, we are, uh, we have to address when we use FRP composite, you know, for uh, both existing structure and new construction. So I think the first, uh, of course, I take the marine concrete infrastructure as example. Uh, of course, you know, uh, a structure just like human being, you know, from its birth to its, you know, it will experience degradation, okay, and eventually, you know, till the end of a surface life. So basically, I think many of you are familiar with, you know, this figure. Uh, vertical axis, you know, uh, is corrosion uh, for concrete structure subject to marine. I mean, corrosion is a significant issue, okay. And then uh, bottom here is structure performance. Uh, you can see uh, how this structure performance degrades with time. Of course, for different degradation stage, uh, we can have different maintenance strategy. For example, we can using surface coating, uh, we can using cathodic protection, uh, or we also can using FRP repair, uh, strengthening, and so on. So maintenance is very important. It's highly, you know, in fact, our service life of a structure highly depending on the maintenance activity. Okay. So basically, I think we propose to divide the maintenance strategy to four big categories. Uh, first one we call is almost maintenance free stream. Uh, uh, I mean, strategy, okay? So vertical is performance, structure performance. Okay, we set a maintenance limit, okay? I think during the structure service life, we never allow the structure performance to, you know, be below this maintenance limit. Of course, to maintain this uh, maintenance free strategy, I think we need to use very advanced material. FRP reinforcement is one of the choice because it's non-corrosive, okay, in marine environment. Of course, nowadays we have many other type of material like ultra high performance concrete, like engineering cementitious composites. And also we have, you know, once we talk about the sustainability, so we also using low carbon material like a geopolymer concrete. Okay, second uh, strategy, we call it preventive maintenance. Uh, I think uh, surf surface coating uh, is, uh, I think, uh, one of the choice for this preventive maintenance. Regularly, for example, every five years or every 10 years, we implement the surface coating, okay, to the uh, concrete structures so that, you know, the structure can be isolated from external uh, degradation factor like chloride, like water and so on. And in fact, uh, we can incorporate many other functions okay, into the coating, like even for building application, we can implement energy saving property. Of course, this is not today's topic. Of course, external bonded FRP material, in fact, it's also kind of a surface coating material, which can protect the concrete structures from external, I mean, attack. Third so strategy we call the predictive maintenance. Uh, basically, we should rely on this structure healthy monitoring technique. Okay, this means we monitor the structure performance. And then when we find something is wrong or something is skeptical, and then we carry out this uh, maintenance activity. Of course, it is more smart way, okay, to perform the maintenance. Of course, for this strategy, FRP, it's also a idea material because first is FRP itself, okay, can have sensing, I mean, this uh, properties. The second is FRP can be incorporated with like a fiber optic sensor, okay, and then make FRP a sensing structure material, okay, to be used in concrete infrastructure. Of course, the final scheme is 
most often use the scheme so-called corrective uh, maintenance. If you find something wrong, okay, you need to fix it. Usually we have sectional enlargement or externally bonded FRP technology was widely used, uh, I mean, in the past two decades. So if you look at the history of use FRP material for both existing structure and also new structures, basically you can see a few, you know, uh, stages, okay? Before 1990, almost we didn't have any use. We call this incubation stage. And between 1990 and to 2000, last century, okay, uh, I think in North America, especially in Canada, and also Japan was also a leading country in this field and Europe, okay? They, I think, had there was a wide application of FRP material, especially for repair and strengthening of existing structure. I think one driven force for such kind of application is Kobe, a very great Henshin earthquake, a Kobe earthquake in 1995, which I think promoted largely the use of FRP as a seismic retrofuge material. And after 2000, you know, China joined this, you know, uh, in the research and application activity, and then we get you know boom, okay, of this FRP industry. Uh, if you look at so-called, if you check Web of Science, okay, using keyword FRP and concrete, you can see since 2000, okay, the technical paper is more than, you know, tripled, okay. Of course, after this, so, so of course, maybe this application of FRP will enter into maturity period, or even we have further expansion, because at this moment, we haven't seen, I mean, significant contribution from India, uh, Pakistan, Africa, which has a very large population and is still, I mean, have the, uh, is booming in infrastructure uh, development. So basically we have two categories, as I mentioned, one is FRP for existing structure, uh, usually we call externally bounded FRP, and also FRP as an internal reinforcement of concrete structure. Of course, FRP confined concrete pile is also a structure form used for, I mean, in new construction. Of another is FRP shape. Uh, basically, it's a purely FRP uh, structure. Of course, this shape also can be uh, used together with other material to form a composite structure. So my observation on the use of FRP in construction, basically for external bounded FRP, I think the application in fact moved ahead of the research activity. As you can see uh, from 1990 to 2000, we had a lot of application. At that moment, in fact, I think we didn't have international, a wide availability of international code or practice. You can see uh, the year of publication for this you know, international code or practice. So why? My understanding is FRP strengthening of existing structure, we have relatively less concern. Anyway, the FRP is an additional contribution to original capacity of concrete uh, structure. And so we didn't really care about the post repair durability. Just now, you know, Dr. Nagai also mentioned, I mean, the life cycle performance after we repair, what will happen? So, and especially is a seismic retrofit because we focus more on ductility rather than strength. So anyway, you add FRP, your ductility will improve. So relatively, I think the safety issue is not that concern. But for FRP reinforced a new concrete structure, we have very big concerns, okay? Because after all, FRP is a brittle material. So we will consider, you know, safety. Of course, if you take the surface stress level, it's very low, then of course you need to spend a lot of money. Cost effectiveness is also an issue, okay? And uh, uh, durability, how long it will last. So I, I think at this moment, we haven't answered this question very well. So I think relatively, we have limited application of FRP composite in new construction. Of course, now we have increased. So I believe at this moment, through 30 years, almost 30 years development already, I think it might be a time for us, first for existing structure, we started to concede, okay, post repair performance prediction. Okay, the so durability of FRP uh, strengthening RC structures means how long we need answer, how long it can last. Then we can calculate the so-called life cycle cost. I think especially when we confront 
you know, massive scale of infrastructure deterioration, we should consider cost issue as well. Okay, to achieve this purpose, I believe a much better and precise understanding of the whole strengthening system is needed. So I think it we need improve further improve our knowledge. Second is with the better understanding of this FRP material and also FRP in corporate structure, I believe, I think we will have a wider use of FRP uh, composite in new construction, especially in corrosive environment. Like, uh, but uh, of course, as I mentioned, FRP after all, it's a brittle material. So we have to use it in a smart way. Okay, so I think regarding these two aspects, I just using two technical topic, okay, uh, which I think uh, uh, started in my research group to illustrate first, how we can achieve a better and precise understanding. And the second is how we can using FRP in a smart way. I using FRP plus X. FRP is a brittle material, but we can through the combined use of FRP and the other material and to optimize our structure performance and also, you know, uh, low our cost. So first example, I, I just take existing concrete structure as example, uh, using interface debonding. Of course, this is one of the most fundamental problem for external bonded uh, FRP technology. So you can see we have flexural strengthener and the shear strengthener, but the problem is once you're using more FRP material, you cannot fully utilize the tensile strength of FRP. You're just very using a very limited portion of FRP uh, concrete strength due to this debonding problem. Of course, I think in the past two decades, you know, our research community has achieved, you know, good understanding of this debonding mechanism, you know, under various uh, condition, uh, especially, you know, uh, Professor Ting uh, from uh, my colleague, you know, from PolyU, he even wrote a textbook on this uh, very detailed analysis of different debonding mode. However, usually when we study this debonding, uh, we call, we, this is in fact, uh, you know, we use this so-called pull off test, okay, to examine the interface property uh, between FRP and concrete. And then we try to propose a so-called, you know, tau S model uh, to simulate the behavior of interface as well as the whole structure. But uh, have we precisely understand such interface behavior? So unfortunately, I have to say, not yet. Although we have, I mean, uh, carried out more than, you know, 20 years of study. First example is using, you know, if you see in real case, we're using FRP in a beam. In fact, the beam is subject to bending and other deformations. Okay, so your bending stiffness of your FRP material, in fact, will influence this kind of interface behavior. If you do bond test, using this test app or using the bending test app, you will see, you will observe a significantly different fracture energy. So at this moment, we haven't answered it well, why this happens. Okay, and also if you're using FRP sheet and FRP plate, you will observe different fracture energy. Another thing, example, you can see, you know, in real uh, strings in the beam, especially, you know, large size beam uh, with great depths. In fact, you have quite significant, you know, shear deformation in beam. And if you carry out a fracture analysis, you will find if you have a very small peeling angle, then your debonding load will decrease dramatically. So at this moment, our current design guideline cannot consider this debonding mechanism at all. Similarly, in other, for example, you know, for interface between two cracks, we had some analysis already, but based, basically we assume we have a same bond suggest slit relationship for all these kind of condition. But in fact, the boundary condition for interface under this case and on this case are significantly different. Whether we have a unified tau S model for all the condition, at this moment, we cannot answer well. So this is basically, so I think we need to rely on fracture mechanics approach to precisely predict how the failure occurs. 
okay, inside the concrete, inside the interface, and even inside the FRP. I think then we can reach a more precise understanding of this interface debonding mechanism. Similarly, aliases effect. So this is, of course, I carry out this test many years ago. You can see if we're using different adhesive, even failure occurs in concrete, you can see the final debonding strength, you know, from this uh, load deflection curve uh, for a beam subject to bending, you can see they have significantly different, you know, debonding strength. Uh, if you're even using more soft adhesive, you can see this uh, blue one, okay, even you achieve much higher debonding strength. At this moment, our current code of practice cannot reflect the effect of adhesive. Similarly, FRP sheet geometry. I think this is a product developed by Nitiz Composites. They call the strand sheet. Of course, we name it, I, I, I name it micro FRB bar, okay? So if you're using same FRB amount, but if you're using different FRB geometry, you also can see even you have same fiber amount, if you have different geometry, you eventually your bond strength will also be different. So this is mechanically. If we can see the environment action, okay? So the first concern, big concern is the effect of moisture. Since we are going to using FRP, you know, to repair and strengthening marine concrete structures. Similarly, we did this kind of test. I mean, we put this spacements FRP bonded concrete under in water or using wet and dry cycle. You can see after wet and dry cycling, the bonding mode will change from concrete inside concrete to you know adhesive to concrete interface or even between you know primer and adhesive. Of course, this time dependent behavior at this moment we cannot predict well. In code of practice, we simply using a material factor for FRP to explain this film. Now, of, of course, the mechanism is wrong. So of course we try now, uh, I think in the past two decades, we try to using, you know, some more microscopic, you know, uh, even uh, model, uh, molecular dynamics approach to try to see what happens, you know, between adhesive and the concrete. I think now we achieve better understanding, okay, at the MD level, what happens, okay, between epoxy and the concrete, but the how to bridge you know, this MD level behavior and the microscopic behavior and even macroscopic behavior. And that reflect this, I mean, relationship in code of practice remain as a big challenge for us. This is moisture. In terms of temperature, same. If you want using FRP in real condition, in fact, you may attach FRP to concrete or steel service in summer or in winter. You have quite large, you know, temperature variation of course, this temperature variation will cause two effects. One is so-called thermal incompatibility because FRP and the concrete, they may have different, you know, thermal expansion of coefficient. The second thing, if you have very high temperature, your adhesive may degrade. We call the temperature induced material degradation. So how to isolate this effect, how to predict this effect, you know, to develop code or practice, it still remain unknown at this moment. We just have a very discreet, pretty discreet way in code of practice. For example, we need to control the surface temperature under like a glass transition temperature of FRP material or adhesive material, something. But uh, this does affect, you know, the debonding strength. I mean, the strength of the FRP strength and the concrete or steel system. Here, this is my student experiment, you know, done recently by my student, you can see even under surface temperature from zero to six, we have quite significant change of this debonding strength. I, we call it plate end debonding or IC debonding. Okay, if you are familiar with the interface mechanics, basically these two are very dominated, you know, debonding mechanism in FRP strength and RC beams. And of course, even for fire, you know, we sometimes FRP uh, FRP composites, you know, it's weak in fire, okay? It may, it's combustible. Sometimes we need using a single layer of insulation to protect the FRP. So how to predict such kind of performance? Nowadays, I think we get a better understanding. So I think all this better understanding can lead to a more precise, you know, prediction of 
structure performance, I mean, time dependent structure performance of FRP strings and RC beams. Okay, I think this will help us to predict the repair cost, lifetime repair cost. And the second topic I want to share you is, you know, use FRP composite in a smart way. Okay, I call this FRP plus X. As I mentioned, FRP is a linear brittle elastic brittle material. Okay, so first I, again, I using existing structure, you know, strengthening of existing structure as an example. As you can see, the reason for this debonding, in fact, is a brittle elastic of FRP means FRP cannot have crack, but concrete we have crack with discontinuity in concrete. So this incompatibility of deformation, in fact, causes the debonding and the local stress concentration. So to solve this problem, you can see in the past decades, okay, a lot of research have been done so-called on FRPC, uh, FRCM strengthening system, fiber reinforced cementitious matrix. We give up using epoxy, but we're using cementitious matrix as a bonding adhesive and a matrix material of FRP to strengthening existing structure. So here, first example is FRP plus ECC. I guess you know all of, all, all of you know uh, what's the meaning of ECC. Uh, ECC is a ductile you know, string hardening material, as you can see, a uh, rupture string usually is 4%, okay? This material can be a ideal adhesive material for FRP. So basically, before the debonding occurs, this material will yield first. So you can see, we try to using FRP grid together with such an ECC material for flexure strengthening of RC beam. Ah, uh, you can see what happened. In fact, at the ultimate limit state, you don't see any debonding. Eventually, even you can get you know rupture of FRP grid. That means you can fully utilize the strength of FRP material. Another example is using FRP microbar together with geopolymer. Uh, I think because bonding between substrate uh, and your repair material is very important. And in our research, we found geopolymer, in fact, has a very excellent bonding property with concrete substrate. Of course, you know, geopolymer, it's a, a environment friendly material, low carbon material. Basically, you know, it uh, compared to ordinary Portland cement, you know, it's CO2 emission is much low. It's about more than 50% low but it has very excellent bonding property of its concrete. So that's why we develop system, so-called FRP microbar reinforced geopolymer. So I have a PhD project doing this, as you can see uh, from this DIC filters, uh, you can see, in fact, you don't have, you have very delayed debonding. And eventually after this strengthening, you, your, your system achieve both good strength and also still remain good ductility. And for shear, we did a similar uh, test also for shear enhancement, okay? We also get a significant shear enhancement. So of course, to explain this phenomenon, because once you're using geopolymer bonded to concrete, then we have two different bonding system. One is OPC bonding system, the other is geopolymer binder system. So of course, we again, we need to study its interfacial behavior to see why this better bonding is achieved. Of course, again, we can start from this microscopic uh, uh, okay, microscopic analysis, and also now we are carrying you know uh, MD uh, molecular you know uh, dynamics analysis to try to explain what happens between geopolymer binder and aggregate, and what happens between different binding system. And also we are trying to using FRP bar grid together with UHP ECC. UHP ECC means we have very high strength, like uh, more than 150 megapascal. In the meantime, we still have, you know, very good tensile ductility. So we term this material as ultra high performance ECC. Okay, we can use FRP material together with to make a thin plate and then produce so-called permanent form work, okay?
Okay, so permanent formwork to protect your structure. That means during concrete construction, this plate can act as a formwork. After completion of construction, this formwork will stay permanently with structure, protect the inside concrete structure. This is a way utilize, you know, of utilizing FRP in an economic way. Of course, how to make this thin plate? Of course, we are doing because as I mentioned, FRP is a linear brittle material. And also once you have a crack, it will easily you know, cause local stress concentration. So your FRP material may subject to premature rupture. So we try to using this FRP together with you know, uh, UHP ECC. You can see compared to the plain, this red one is plain uh, cementitious matrix. This is one is UHP ECC matrix. You can see we can get the significantly increase both strength and the ductility. Uh, this is using uh, grid. Similarly, using FRB bar. So we also can get the much improved strength and ductility. Okay. So and uh, make the, this thin plate fill in flexure. In fact, it's quite challenging when you're using a linear material together with plain concrete, you easily get a shear failure. Okay. So we try to using this plate, okay, very ductile plate to create construct a composite structure. One example is box covered. You know, for underground utility, you know, you, you need, you know, produce this kind of box covered. Okay. We can using this FRP. Uh, reinforced UHP ECC as an internal and external, you know, cover, okay? I, as I mentioned, uh, per, uh, act as a permanent formwork and then form a composite structure. Of course, you don't have to using this UHPC in whole volume, okay, that is, which is very expensive. And of course, when, once we, uh, I mean, try to realize this idea, we need to study the interface behavior as well. Uh, we need to ensure, you know, the FRP reinforced UHP ECC can work together with the concrete substrate. Okay, so we try to, you know, create a different, you know, interface bonding geometry. And you can see, of course, different bonding geometry, they will cause uh, different bonding strengths. And another good idea, I think it's, FRP reinforcement together with seawater, sea sand, concrete. As you know, uh, in our university, uh, Professor J.G. Teng, who is now our president, he in fact uh, leading a big project uh, on the use of FRP together with seawater, sea sand, concrete, okay, for uh, sustainable uh, construction. This is especially suitable for marine construction. Uh, we call this is two birds, one stone, uh, I mean, this solution. So you don't need using fresh water. Okay, you can save the use of fresh water. On the other hand, you don't have to wash, you know, sea water or sea sand, okay, which is usually not allowed uh, for use in conventional concrete structures. So if we combine these two materials together, it creates an economic, okay, uh, solution. And another thing is a FRB bar together with seawater, sea sand. So we also tried, you, you know, to combine this using seawater, sea sand to produce, you know, ultra high performance ECC material, and then use it together with FRB bar. And this kind of use can elevate the stress concentration in FRB bar at the correct location so that we also can use the FRP material more efficiently. Uh, of course, this is the material property of the ultra high performance, you know, seawater, sea sand, ECC we have created in our laboratory. Uh, you can see at the ultimate limit state, you know, uh, we have fully saturated the crack, okay, in the material. And also we're using FRB reinforcement with FRB connector, as you see here, uh, this tubular connector is what we developed for this sandwich wall system. Okay, and plus some green concrete, then we can produce a sustainable, I mean, sandwich wall panel system for prefabricated construction. Prefabricated construction now is very popular, popularly used in Hong Kong and also in mainland China. 
and uh, we perform flexural test, okay, to examine the performance of this shear connector. And also we do, you know, axial loading task, okay, to see, you know, the, and also eccentric and concentric okay, axial loading test on this sandwall uh, panel system to see, you know, how it fail and also to predict its ultimate strength. And another try in our group is we try to use FRP composite for floating structure. I mean, in collaboration with those experts in geotechs. So we can using FRP for this, you know, mooring system for floating structure. And also we can using FRP to develop this bridge, uh, prefabricated bridge. And also we can using FRP to, pre to you know, prefabricate you know, this, this building so that we can shorten the construction time and improve the durability, okay, of these floating structures. And also, of course, FRP sheet pile uh, can be widely used, you know, when once we, you know, develop land, for example, using recrimination method, uh, we need this seawall. FRP sheet pile is a good, I mean, structure form for seawall. And also I have another PhD student uh, try to use, uh, okay, FRP tube, okay, in field with some granular, uh, granular material like sand, okay. This is in fact for, you know, land reclamation, I mean, this application, sometimes we need FRP sheet pile and inside usually filled in, you know, sea sand or other, you know, uh, granular, like a recycled concrete block and so on. And uh, we try to, you know, using FRP tube together with granular material and try to predict its structure behavior. Uh, this is show the friction behavior between FRP tube and granular material. So I think uh, to conclude my talk, so basically I just briefly, you know, show you how we can use the FRP in a smart way or how to predict FRP strength and RC members in a more precise or to achieve a much better understanding to facilitate, you know, life cycle performance prediction. So my understanding is FRP material standing alone may have some problem. For example, it's a brittleness, it's a linear elastic, you know, brittleness, and also sometimes it's a fire, uh, resistance, uh, sensitivity to moisture and temperature and so on. So I think we can using FRP plus X. Okay, this X can be many other new type of material like high strength steel, UHBC, ECC, geopolymer, whatever, seawater, seas and concrete. And then we can achieve a much better and smart use of FRP to solve many other problems like sustainability, resilience. We focus on rapid, you know, restoration. Okay, FRP is a linear material. Of course, it's suitable for resilience improvement. Carbon neutral, ocean exploration, maintenance and the recycling and extreme environment, extreme loading, prefabric construction, rent creation. I think all these issues are quite big and important issue for our current infrastructure development. I believe if we using FRP appropriately, okay, based on our in-depth understanding of the material performance, I think FRP will have a very bright future. I think uh, we still have many younger researchers uh, who are trying to you know, get into this field. So finally, I want to acknowledge you know, uh, my group members uh, postdoctor fellow, uh, PhD candidates, and the RA. Uh, so all the work I present in my slide uh, are done by them. Okay. So to and finally, I want to take this opportunity to make an advertisement uh, of our PhD studentship at PolyU. Now we have two schemes. One is PolyU Presidential, you know, PhD Fellowship. The other is Hong Kong PhD Fellowship. I think the package, whole package is quite decent. If you are interested in Hong Kong and also interested in using FRP or any other, you know, innovative material to achieve infrastructure sustainability, feel free to contact me. So with that, so thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Dai. Yeah.
Thank you. And also, I feel that you are still very young. You are doing yeah. the maintenance of yourself, not only uh, Professor Wedan. You also are doing very well to maintain yourself. And, okay, so yeah, thank, thank you very much covering the yeah, wide range of the uh, issues in this field in practice and uh, yeah, uh, scientifically and in practice. And also you show that yeah, many possible applications now and in the future. And uh, you are doing many researches as well. And so that we can get uh, our own new research topics from you. So thank you, you know, it's good for, our, for us, like researchers can get a new idea for our new research topics. And then, yeah, and also it covers most of the question that I would like to give you later in the panel discussion. You have already answered most of them. But may, may I ask one thing about uh, uh, maybe bond? Bond problem between FRP and the concrete, you pointed out uh, maybe middle of your presentation, how difficult it is. Because what's the difference between FRP concrete bond and the normal steel bar and the concrete bond? Because I know that uh, you have pro you also propose the tau relationship uh, between FRP and the concrete. And that is, uh, I would say, conceptually similar to the steel and the concrete model. So then, yeah, and it's not new model. Yeah, and then you and the Professor Weda have made a really nice, excellent bond model. But you say it's not enough. What's the difference between the concrete and steel bars bond and your program? May, may I know about the difference? Yeah, of course. First, uh, I mean, thing is the difference between steel bar and FRP. Because mm -hmm. in steel bar, in case you provide sufficient anchorage length, you mm -hmm. still will yield. Mm -hmm. But for FRP, it's not the case. No matter mm -hmm. how long you know you, you provide to your anchorage length, eventually FRP bar will fail before the material fra fracture. Mm -hmm. Especially you're using FRP plate because for real structure, usually your structure scale is quite large. You you sheet for seismic retrofit, sheet may be enough, but uh, usually for bridge good strength and you're using FRB plate, which bending stiffness is much larger than, F, than, than sheet. In mm -hmm. fact, if you don't use pre-stress or good anchorage system, your use able, I mean, strength is very limited. So mm -hmm. this is, I think, a big difference uh, between steel. So then come back to, to the question. Of course, in uh, during my PhD study, you know, in Hokkaido University, we try to develop a tau S model to describe so-called mode two behavior, okay, mm -hmm. how is the relationship between FRP and the concrete. But this is basically based on this simple test geometry. Mm -hmm. uh, we call it pull-off test. But the reality is much complex than this. As I mentioned, your right figure, if you have bending, if your plate, your bending stiffness is much larger than FRP sheet. Even you have a very small slide deformation in your structure, it will cause a significant reduction of the material strength. I mean, mm. structures, I mean, the strength of the strength in the system. Mm. But why in the past two decades, we didn't pay great attention to this issue. As I mentioned, this is for existing structure. Anyway, we think we put something on it, at least mm. strength improvement. No matter how much is improved is not the issue. But mm -hmm. once we really care how much, you know, exactly for real structure improvement, and the other thing is how long this strengthening effect can last, I think we have to have a precise, more precise understanding. Mm -hmm. Not only that, I mean, mechanism under different stress condition, and also need to consider environment factor, temperature, moisture, and, and so on. Yeah, this is my view. I think in... in Last century, I think in Japan, the major application in seismic retrofit. Mm. So in fact, the bond is not a critical issue, not, mm. a, not a critical issue. Mm. And for existing structure, as I mentioned in my previous slide, people think anyway, before you put FRP, your structure is still there. Or once you put FRP, at least become better. So mm. I think their concern on safety and the strength is less, less, I mean, even cost. I mean, they have less concern. This is my understanding. But I think in, through two decades, now I think we are in the period to develop more 
I mean advanced model or more mm. advanced technical guideline to okay. predict such performance. Hmm. I see. So do, do you think that uh, that yeah, I'm not different thing is that you use a resin and the uh, adhesive layer anyway. Yeah. So that that isn't that that critical problem or not not so much yet compared to the concrete steel relationship. Yeah, even the FRP is very good, but the adhesive layer like a resin or primer having some problem, then having a uh, delamination or peeling earlier than the FRP rupture. Yeah, that's why I say uh, we need FRP plus X. Mm. Mm. FRP yeah. is linear brittle. We mm -hmm. should consider in different stress condition how mm. we should introduce X. Mm. Of course, uh, here, just one example for flexural dish strengthening. Uh, as I mentioned, we may using FRCM. Mm. which is because, you know, using ECC, because ECC, mm. in fact, it's a higher ductile, highly mm. ductile yeah. material. It may yield before the failure of concrete. Mm. That means it's kind of soft adhesive. It's kind oh, of okay. soft adhesive. Mm. This is one, one idea. Another, I mean, good example, I think just now, we didn't see Professor Weda mentioned in his presentation, for seismic retrofit, maybe using low elastic mm. modulus FRP. Yeah make your design more economic and cost effective. That's mm -hmm. why I say at this stage, once we reach better understanding on this fundamental failure behavior, I think now we know how to optimize the design for mm. improved cost effectiveness and structure performance. Mm. Yeah. Okay. okay, thank you very much. Okay, okay, let me move on to the panel discussion so that Taya once here yeah, let us you finished the presentation from Professor Dai. Thank you very much, Professor Dai, again. Thank you. Okay, so. Shall I stop my sharing uh, my yes, please. PPT? Okay. Okay, I stop. Okay. Yeah, then, the, yeah, uh, yeah, time is limited, but uh, we're gonna have uh, uh, some uh, short discussion time. And then the, uh, your first three, yeah, maybe do some questions that, Professor Weda already answered, but uh, uh, Professor Weda, uh, do you have any other comments or some you are interested in or you'd like to answer to some questions? Maybe you cannot to answer to all, but uh, if you select some, yeah, can you give some comments to that uh, question from the uh, audience? Yes, I have replied the uh, several questions, <laughs> and uh, I think it's okay. I think I have answered to them, but I have one question to Doctor Dai, Professor Dai. <laughs> ah, okay, you have. Okay. Uh, yes. Do you believe external bonding? Yeah. We only simply have the uh, external bonding at the interface. Is good enough? without any additional assurance to prevent uh, the bonding, such as anchorage. Yeah, okay, is, is, is that all? Okay, yes, my yeah, yeah, thank you for your question. This is a really nice question. In fact, uh, you know, recently within IFC, you know, we are discussing, you know, I mean, the anchorage system. I mean, I mean, how to develop a you know, good guideline for anchorage system for external bonded FRP. Of course, I think two ways. One is using post-tension method so that we can have a strong fix at the uh, FRP end, okay? Or other, you know, uh, some other group, even I think uh, Professor Teng's group, you know, how to develop, uh, optimize the U shape, okay? To, to uh, ensure, you know, and also FRCM, it's also a, a try. I think as FRP, if FRP standing alone is used to strengthening existing structure, I think if for temporarily, uh, if we don't really care how long it lasts, it's okay. But if we really want to ask how long it can stand, if we really want to know, I think people more or less have concern. So that's why we may need additional uh, anchorage system this is my understanding to this issue. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, so okay, let us move on to the yeah, panel discussion time. 
And then, the, yeah, I, I have already prepared some topics to be discussed. And then, the, the, mo most of them were about the future or real application of the FRP. Yeah, Professor Dai already answered. And uh, if you are interested in the best way is that uh, you you join Professor Dai's research group. <laughs> he offers well, thank you, thank you. Uh, yeah. host for you so that you can study further about the FRP under his supervision. But, uh, yeah, I want to know about the uh, history as a, yeah, together with the future. So because that now the FRP research, including fiber reinforced concrete yeah, research as well, so many research papers are published now, yeah, as Dr. Dai presented today. But uh, originally, yeah, like uh, that this is also Professor Dai presented, like uh, Kobe earthquake, 1995. And just after that, we Japan applied the FRP strengthening a lot. But uh, at that time, the yeah, research situation, what happens around that or before? What, what kind of technological development was done uh, around the 1980s or 1990s? Yeah, we want to know about the situation at that time or the meaning of the FRP researches yeah, from uh, Professor Weda, can, can you give some uh, information for us about the uh, emerging of the FRP researches? Yeah, Professor Dai, thank you very much for showing that. Yeah, I, I prepared a slide. I think Weda is into maybe yeah. I, I, some background info. If you have better one, I... I... No, no, no. Uh, please, Professor Dai, you, you, you prepare this one, please. Yeah. <laughs> I think uh, Professor Weira know all the story because he, <laughs> he he joined this FRB committee from very beginning. I, I think uh, Professor Weira, you can introduce briefly. I mean, the whole history. Mm. Whole FRB history. Committee. Okay, so, my history yeah. <laughs> started from uh, Professor Dai mentioned that uh, uh, 90s, 90s uh, when our Japanese group JC preparing the uh, FRP standards for the embedded reinforcement. So JSC concrete committee uh, set up the uh, committee and subcommittee to prepare the uh, standard I mean, guidelines. Then at that time, we started some the uh, collaboration with the uh, US expert, uh, Professor Tony Nani. And uh, then our Kobe earthquake, yeah, really changed our scene. So we, most of the people shifted to the uh, external bonding, I mean, uh, repairing uh, purpose with the FRP uh, reinforcement, especially seismic retrofit. Then, yeah, later part, uh, JSC uh, issued the uh, first uh, guideline, I think 2001, with the, under the professor, uh, uh, chairman of the Professor Mariama, and uh, I was the secretary of that uh, committee. And then, yeah, at that time, yes, I believe that uh, Japan, I mean, our research activities is leading the uh, best part of the world, I mean, in terms of the uh, uh, research and also practical applications and also the, some standards as well. Then after that, I think a uh, period of the China started, but uh, in fact, before that, uh, in fact, uh, not the other uh, reinforcement for concrete, China already started a uh, lot of FRP composite as a structural component. So the China has a very long history, much longer and stronger history, but the most of the application, I believe this is GFRP. Then now, after we become the 21st century, yes, quite a big movement, especially research activities. I think this is led by Professor Teng. Yeah, it's, they really made a uh, big Yeah, I think I, I collect some information, yeah. Yeah, then, yeah, Professor Dai, you can follow afterwards, yes. Yeah. 2000, I think uh, China's, uh, I mean, research activity boomed in, in this field uh, since 2000. And especially recently, 
uh, we have, I mean, a few quite big project. I mean, in the field of FRP uh, reinforcement for construction. For example, the first one I just mentioned, you know, sustainable marine infrastructure enabled by innovative use of seawater, seas, and concrete of FR and FRP composites. This is led by Professor Ting uh, from my university. It's about Hong Kong million, 47 million, okay? And uh, similarly in Shenzhen University, uh, well, you know, Professor Weda is working. Uh, his team, in fact, uh, got a project led by Professor Zhu Jihua. Also, it's a very big project, research on key technology of new ICCP SS, carbon fiber composite, seawater, sea sand, uh, reinforced concrete building structures for new structures. I think this is also around, you know, 40 million renminbi, which is also very big project. And the other two projects, in fact, in mainland China, we just complete one project, so-called, you know, in China, we have 12, 5, 13, 5, 14, 5 national plan. So we just complete a 13, 5 national plan project. I mean, research and application of key technology or high performance FRP composite material new structure. This is led by uh, Professor Li Rong and Professor Yue Qing Rui, you know, uh, from uh, Metrically, you know, Corporation of China. This is a very big construction group in China. It's about 30 million RMB. And also, you know, uh, Professor Wu Zisheng, uh, who also worked in uh, Ibaraki University in Japan, he is leading a national uh, engineer research center focusing on developing basalt fiber products and also their engineer application. I think this is a several ongoing big research project in this particular area. So I'm quite uh, optimistic on the use of this material in new structure. I see in future five to 10 years in mainland China, I will see a big in increase because eventually, you know, those kind of research uh, achievement outcome will be applied in engineering practice. So this is, I mean, brief situations. I, I think since 2000, but uh, I don't know. To, now India, as I mentioned, Pakistan, Africa. In fact, yesterday I just received an email from Jamaica. They want to have this material test method for FRP and also they ask whether there is some design guideline. So maybe in future Africa, there, there will be a growth. In, in this particular uh, research field and application. Of course, I, I'm not very sure, but at this moment, I think their contribution to this field is still limited, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, we, we learned how strong China is now and uh, yeah, having a plan to use AFRP in the future. So uh, as Doc, Dr. Dai mentioned about that uh, design guideline. If we have a design guideline, for example, Jamaica or other country also can use this kind of material use uh, efficiently. So uh, again, Professor Weda, may I know about that? May we know about that? Yeah, design guideline. Yeah, 1995, after the Kobe earthquake, in Japan developed that, uh, some uh, design guideline or recommendation. Then after that, well, what is happening? And then how, how is the situation now all over the world? Uh, okay, uh, design guideline issues. All right, let me start with the Japan case. Uh, we have the two design guidelines, one for the embedded I mean, internal reinforcement, and the other one is external voltage reinforcement. The embedded reinforcement, uh, just this year, uh, Japan Placed Concrete Institute, under the leadership of the Professor Mutsuyoshi, uh, they uh, issue the uh, updated version of the uh, JSC uh, guideline, which was uh, uh, printed uh, more than 20 years ago. So uh, we have some newest uh, guidelines, but uh, in contents of the technology, I mean, technological essence in the guideline, we don't have much difference, I believe. Then, uh, but uh, this is not a guideline, their application. I mean, United States, uh, they have started, not uh, all the state, but especially Michigan, state of Michigan. They really started uh, using uh, carbon CFRP tendons. 
and also CFRP uh, internal reinforcement for new structures. So probably United States is currently a leading country to have the, uh, those internal reinforcement. And also they have already the guidelines. That's why they have, they can have the practical applications. And uh, <clears throat> other countries, yes, uh, European community, FRP, uh, FIB, yeah, they have the group of the FRP reinforcement. I mean, sorry, external bonded FRP reinforcement. And then FRP, FIB issued the uh, standard or guidelines for design and construction, even maintenance. Then latest uh, uh, outcomes will be included uh, our next FIB model code which will be available hopefully next year, the first draft. So the European group uh, within the FIB activities, they have standards. Then also ISO, we have the international standards, but since uh, Asian group and the European group and the United States group, they are real design method it's uh, not the same, different. So ISO has already issued the, uh, some kind of the umbrella code, which can be a model of the, all the existing uh, standards all over the world. Yeah, that is what I can say at this moment. Mm. So in practice, that you, you say that now in the US, Yes. That's very active to use that. Can, can you say that now the US is in the country that mostly use the FRP material or the structures using uh, FRP? Yes, uh, the internal reinforcement. Uh, internal reinforcement. Yes, uh, external reinforcement probably all over the world. Mm, yes, European country rehabilitation of the many old buildings, including historical building, mm. and also Yes, I think I don't know much about the China case, but I believe China also has many cases. Mm -hmm. And in Japan, we consistently have the application, mostly seismic retrofit and also some rehabilitation, prevention mm -hmm. of the uh, concrete cover separation and so on. Mm -hmm. So uh, constantly we have the repairing market is, exist. Mm -hmm. may, may I know a little bit that uh, Different thing about a similar topic about yeah, this slide about the publications. So, Professor Weda, that, that yeah, in the 1990s, the Japan did a lot of yes. research works for the FRP, yes. but yes. Uh, I feel that it's now decreasing. And then, yes. yeah, many publications from China. Yes. So, one of the things that, uh, yeah, but Japan used the FRP mainly for the seismic retrofit. In that yes. sense, that the bone doesn't become a big issue. But yes. uh, anyway, that, yeah, China publishing many papers about Japan decreasing. How do you think about this situation? What, do you have any <laughs> comments <Okay>. on it? <laughs> yeah, let, let me start first. Then maybe Professor Dai yeah. <laughs> says something different view. Uh, uh, of course, I cannot say precisely why our community is less active in Japan. But I don't know if this is a result or a cause. Uh, it's rather difficult to get the funding, mm -hmm. research fund from mm -hmm. Japan, in Japan, with directly FRP related uh, project. But in China, it's one of the direct, still directions. Once they related the FRP composite, it's, they can rather easily get uh, research funding. This is what I observed so far. Then, of course, still, especially uh, bonding issues, and from now on, on as Professor Dai mentioned, that the long-term performance of the bonding issues or FRP material itself, it, those things can be, I mean, you, you can write many papers, in fact. I don't know, that is the situation. So uh, I think uh, this is one of the Chinese researchers' reason 
to still continue research FRP because they can write the papers. And uh, I hope that uh, those research outcomes really become also promote the uh, usage of the FRP composite. Then I'm not sure in China if this is a case or not. All right, so Professor Dai, you can follow. Okay, yeah, basically I agree uh, with Willison's opinion, but I slightly different, you know, uh, yeah. thinking. Uh, first, I think uh, Japan, China, basically the infrastructure development lies in different stages. Mm. So in Japan, uh, unless there is a big earthquake as happen, you know, happen, basically the, everything is ready. So means our main focus is on repair and strengthening, upgrading of the existing structure. And after 20 years, the work is almost done. But China, I think they face both challenges. One is existing structure starting to degrade. The other is we still have, I mean, a big need, okay, of developing new infrastructure. I think this is the first thing. Second thing, I think uh, this paper booming is not particular in this field. I think <laughs> all the That's field right. are right. the same. <laughs> Yes. Because you know China has a very big population. I think uh, if you see uh, in material, new material field, I I guess uh, more than fifty percent contribution are from mainland China. I I don't think this is a particular phenomenon for FRP composite in construction. This trend happens in any field, because we have a large population of people and all of them studying do research, <laughs> so. So that's why you can see even we have increased number of journal you know, a lot. Even so, you know, we still have a lot of, you know, submissions. Yeah, I, this is my, my understanding. Yeah, my understanding. But uh, I think eventually, I think uh, Professor Wither's opinion is correct. I, the final purpose, of course, our purpose is not for publication. I think it's two things. One is for better scientific understanding the problem. I think eventually we need to promote I mean, the practical application of this material uh, in, in actual engineering. I, I, I think uh, at, at this moment, the trend is quite, quite good. Yeah. Mm. Okay, thank you very much for your comments. And then, the, yeah, time is limited, but uh, may I ask, yeah, once again, Professor Weda, uh, yes. about the future of this research field, because Professor Dai already proposed or uh, introduced our new directions. So among them, or to that direction, uh, is there any uh, comment or uh, something that you support or uh, some part disagree or something? Yeah, how, how do you think about uh, the direction <laughs> of the future research? Yeah, based on the Professor Dai's uh, presentation. Uh, yes, what the Professor Dai presented us, yeah, it's a very good example for the uh, immediate future research direction. Yes, it's quite good. So the uh, uh, using utilizing for P as a part of the uh, composite, I think uh, we have the many ways to utilize it. And uh, not only the long fiber, but the short fiber is also another interesting issue, I believe. And uh, besides that, uh, since yeah, this is a concrete committee, but the uh, composite structure case, I think uh, FRP can be utilized more. But the only the thing is for the society, whether they can accept a composite as a reliable material or not, I think uh, that is one of the issues which we have to overcome. Uh, then, as I said, I repeat, internal reinforcement, uh, the long-term performance with the internal FRP reinforcement, is, I have almost no issue for long-term performance. So the, yeah, one of the directions should be uh, more application as a internal FRP reinforcement. Then what to do so, yeah, we still have some research we have to make. And one more thing is, yeah, long-term performance for external bonded case, uh, the, not only fiber, but also polymer itself, matrix, uh, long-term performance, and also interface between fiber and the matrix. We have many things to do. Yes, mm -hmm. we don't need much 
knowledge on the long-term performance. Mm. In this sense, I fully agree with the Dr. Dai. Okay. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Professor. <coughs> so the uh, last question to Professor Dai. So yeah, for, for the development of the new type of structures, yeah, you, you are trying to combine that, yeah, plus X, like an ECC or other geopolymer and so on. So that once we combine the several materials and then try to get the uh, well, best performance, so nowadays, for example, artificial intelligence, AI, or other information technology can sometimes support, support us, not, not just doing the many experiment, but uh, to estimate the best mix or best combination using some IT powers. Do, do you have any idea about the, the utilization of the IT technologies, including AI and so on? Yeah, surely, you know, using this AI, uh, I think it's one important direction uh, for mm. us, even for civil engineering. I mean, especially for maintenance activity and you know, monitoring activity and assessment activity. I think they, they, they will be a very important tool. But I think to facilitate this method, uh, very important issues to accumulate a substantial, I mean, amount of data. Uh, mm. Uh, especially for new material. For example, if you want to predict the durability based on AI, mm. you need to have a very good you yeah. know, data pool to, mm. to facilitate that. Yeah. So it depends. But I think in future, it will become uh, one, one, one choice. Mm. So, and also when we write technical paper, in fact, we, you see you know, the data available, even a lot of data available, many of them are not usable because they are, Mm -hmm. They don't provide sufficient information. Mm -hmm. Okay, so for example, they say GFRP is bad, but they're just bad in their test. You know, we 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 need to follow. I mean, some standard test method and using same mixed proportion, and then we can reach some. I mean, really useful or, or mm -hmm. conclusions. Mm -hmm. So this is a difficult issue, but I think AI should be one option mm -hmm. in the future. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your yeah, nice answers and uh, yeah, it's really informative for all of us. So the yeah, once again, thank you very much, Professor Weda and the Professor Dai. Uh, due to the limitation of this seminar, we have to close, unfortunately, or regrettably. But anyway, once again, thank you very much for joining today's uh, uh, yeah seminar. Your nice presentation and the discussions. Yeah, we could learn many things from you. And then I, I believe that it's good for all the participants today. So yeah, uh, we got the uh, Q and A questions from the uh, audience. I'm so sorry that uh, we cannot answer to e to all, but uh, uh, yeah, maybe Professor Dai and the way that could can can answer some of them. And also uh, in the questionnaire, uh, we will send the email to you. Then please fill in your uh, questions to them, we try to uh, answer to your questions. Okay, uh, so now it's time so that uh, let us close today's seminar. Once again, thank you very much, Professor Weda and uh, Professor Dai. Then finally, let us introduce or do some advertisement for the next seminar. Sorry, not this one. Oh, sorry. That Okay, the next JSCE Concrete Committee Seminar Frontiers of Concrete Technology uh, is shown here. So the uh, Dr. Miura, uh, he's in charge of organizing this seminar. So can you explain this uh, seminar a little bit? Uh, yes, thank you. So I, I'm uh, uh, Miura from the uh, Nagoya University, Japan. So I am the one of the organizer of this uh, seminar, and uh, I will be uh, moderator of this uh, second uh, seminar. So I'd like to uh, explain, uh, inform that the, the second uh, webinar. So the the second webinar title is the aging management of the concrete structure in the nuclear power plants. So in fact, this uh, is the this topic is uh, collaborate with the. A special issue of the uh, journal journal of advanced concrete technology. So now we can we could invite it, uh, the very uh, very famous researcher. So the who, who are the doctor 
Ipe Mariama and uh, Dr. Miguel Ferreira. So the, the Professor Ipe Mariama is uh, belonging to the uh, Nagoya University and uh, uni the University of Tokyo, Japan. And uh, Dr. Miguel Ferreira is the, uh, the senior scientist of the uh, Structural Materials Group's VTT Technical Research Center of Finland. So uh, they, these two uh, invited researchers are uh, leading the, uh, the aging management of the concrete structures in the nuclear power plants. So it is a very, very, very good uh, opportunity to learn about these topics. So please uh, keep in mind the date. The, this is the, now the tentative one, but uh, please uh, keep in mind. The tentative date is the uh, August 3rd or 4th. August third or fourth. Now I am arranging, so I will uh, I will inform the as soon as possible. So the time is uh, four to eight, uh, four to uh, six p.m. in Japan. So yes, please, please uh, keep in mind that that date. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mira. Okay, so that uh, next topic would be a little bit different from the structural strengthening things but uh, yeah uh, it's uh, a material problem but uh, it's really interesting topic yeah for most of you maybe you you do not relate to the nuclear power plants so but uh, don't worry the based on this topic they will uh, discuss about uh, some durability problem or uh, cement chemical things so that if you are interested in if you are interested in the uh, cement material or concrete material, especially durability and so on. Yeah, it's really good uh, seminar and you can get the really latest uh, research topic in that field. So that I hope you join this one. And then, yeah, as Dr. Miura announced that we will send the uh, uh, information after we fix the date finally. So please join this seminar too. And then this, will be the second one, then we are going to prepare the third or fourth uh, seminar again. So that I hope you join that. And then that uh, we, uh, finally we, JSC Concrete Committee would like to communicate with you. So this is one of the, this seminar is one of the method to communicate with you by distributing our latest uh, interest. And then the, uh, yeah, even that uh, COVID-19 situation, we want to have a good group of research uh, things. So then that we'd like to uh, have a good communication and uh, doing the good uh, research and engineering activities. Okay, that's the end of today's seminar. Once again, thank you very much for your participation today. I hope you enjoy this seminar. Okay, thank you very much, and then see you next time. Thank you very much. Thank Goodbye. You. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. 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 Thank you.